Okay. Um, so first of all, let me just say thanks for having me. It's always wonderful to get a chance to talk to people about issues that I care deeply about. Uh, as a dean, I'm learning that you have less and less opportunity to do research and less and less opportunity to actually get to talk to people about substantive issues. So I always have a uh, I'm thrilled to actually get out and, and be a part of conversations about these things. Um, I want to state from the outset that I do want to think of this as a conversation. I was sort of told in the, in the structure of the event that I should prepare about 40 minutes of remarks and then we could talk for a while longer, but I'm not averse to being interrupted, so if there's something that uh, catches your fancy or, or irks you, feel free to, to <laughs> raise your hand uh, and we can just uh, incorporate it in or I'll say, well, I'm going to get to that and we can come, come back to it. I do want to also state from the outset, um, Mr. Apple just came up to me and, and, and asked if I was going to talk about uh, technology transfer and the issues of theft that go on with respect to China. And we will talk about that, except I just always like to start these talks by being very clear about where I stand on China. And if the title doesn't give it away, um, you know, there's, you, you might think of it of a, among China scholars, and I sort of count myself as a China scholar for going on nearly a quarter of a century now, which is kind of amazing. Uh, but in that the distribution of China scholars, there are those over here who are not only skeptical but think it's a house of cards and it's, a, it's an entirely corrupt system. And then there are those in the middle who think, well, some of that's true, but actually uh, what we thought in the 90s about what was actually happening in China, we were probably wrong about and there is something really robust here. And then there are those over here who are very bullish and I, I'm somewhere out of the picture over here. So um, just so we have a good understanding of what my views on China are. Now, I personally think that those are well-informed views, and I'd be happy to talk about any uh, of the issues um, that, that go into an understanding of China like that, but I, I just kind of want to state from the outset where we are. Um, now, uh, sorry for the lighting on this, but I, I just want to be able to actually describe a little bit of what my background is so I can give you a sense of where, where we're going in this discussion. Uh, I started out actually in the language and literature world. I was a, a literature scholar as, uh, when I was a younger academic. Uh, my PhD is in organizational sociology, and I spent a lot of time thinking about the transformation of state-owned organizations. Now, the transformation of the state sector is a very interesting thing to have studied in the late 80s and 90s, because the transformation of the state sector actually was one of the great stories of the transition from plan to market. Virtually every place that was making a transition from a planned economy to a market economy was failing or having only moderate levels of success. And China's sector, of course, during the 1980s and then with the growth of the sector going into the 90s, um, you start to see a lot of very interesting transformation issues that from an organization's per perspective, for a scholar who thinks a lot about organizations, you have to ask the question, why? Why is China so different? Now, there were a lot of economists during this time that said, well, we kind of got it wrong with one, with respect to one simple issue. China's advantage was that it was less industrialized in Eastern Europe and the, Soviet, the former Soviet economy, and it had such a deeper cheap labor pool than we ever thought, so it basically exported its way out of this. This view, in my opinion, is radically simplistic and basically wrong, um, because there's a much deeper story about the transformation of the state sector that has been a very, very radical innovation for how to run economies. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. Now, one key piece of this that's part and parcel to that story is technology transfer. But I like to think of technology transfer as a broad category. It's not just the transfer of technology writ small, but it's technology writ large that includes management practices and basically the study of competitive organizations within the sector, namely foreign organizations. Okay? And so that's really, I wrote a book on this in the late 1990s that uh, got some attention more recently. My work has been much broad, more broadly defined. I still do a lot of technical work on the transformation of the state se sector, although that work has gone beyond just the transformation of state-owned organizations, and it's now much more about the governance of the transformation of those state-owned organizations into blue-chip companies, many of which are being listed on local and international stock exchanges. But my more popular work these days has been much more about how we think about the transformation of the economy as it relates to social and political transformation in China, and what China's role in the global economy is. And so that work is uh, less technical, but it has, I've tried to actually take a step back and think more broadly about China's role in the global economy. Now this is a story that everybody knows very well. I mean, this is not a radical story at this point. We know about a, a, a 
backwater, third world, developing nation that was literally on the verge of bankruptcy in 1979, that has stormed onto the scene in 30, and within 30 years has become the number two economy in the world, will become the number one economy in the world at some point in the not too distant future, um, and has had such a robust year-on-year -year growth, growth process uh, that it really begs the question of what actually has gone on here. Usually when you see economic growth at the macroeconomic level, uh, for year-on-year double-digit growth, it's usually smaller countries that can control issues a lot more, like Botswana, right? You don't see it sustained this way in places that are this large uh, anywhere else in the world. It's an unprecedented thing. But of course, it's not just about the numbers. It's really about the experience. How many have been to China? Okay, so you've probably gone to Shanghai, you've probably stood on the bun, you've probably looked out across to what was rice fields and broken down factories 20 years ago and seen this futuristic landscape. It's unbelievable. It is an unbelievable story. And to my mind, what I always coach people when I'm talking to, to business leaders about China, you know, Shanghai is just the tip of the iceberg. That's not even where the most interesting stories are. Spend some time in places like the Suzhou Industrial Park and you'll see true magic in developmental innovation. To take a step back though, I think it's important to just get a sense of where this all has come from. So the story I'm going to tell is much more, it's going to have a couple of strands running through it. Some of it is going to be about how we understand what's happened in China over the last 30 years. But it's also going to have a little bit of a comparative straw man because in talking about technology transfer and innovation, and I'm a little bit afraid to talk about this with someone from the Department of Energy in the room because I'm sure you know much more about these issues than I have, I know very little about the technical aspects of, of renewable energy, but I do know something about why China has been so much more successful than the United States. And so it's going to be framed in a way of talking about what China does as, a con as an economy that's the broader landscape of technology transfer. Okay? So, the real whether, whatever image you think of China with respect to, the real image begins here. January 1, 1979, Deng Xiaoping gets on a plane, he comes over to the United States, he basically has broken open the, the Maoist regime within China. Mao died in 76, but Hua Guofeng was going to follow him and it was still going to be this kind of isolationist, inside focused, narrow thinking government. Deng Xiaoping rises to power, and he comes, he gets on a plane, and he goes, he visits Jimmy Carter, but he also goes to three other places. He goes to Seattle, Atlanta, and Houston. Why Atlanta? Coca-Cola. He visited Coke, the Coca-Cola headquarters. Why Seattle? Boeing. Too early for Microsoft, but Boeing was the key. And then, of course, he wanted to see what NASA looked like. Right? That moment. It gives you a sense of just how pragmatic Deng Xiaoping was because he knew in building a world-beating economy, he would have to be pragmatic. Deng Xiaoping was always famous for saying, it doesn't matter if a cat is black or white as long as it catches mice. He was the ultimate pragmatist, which meant that he was basically throwing over communist ideology. For Deng Xiaoping on, China has had very little to do with communist ideology and much more to do with becoming the dom dominant economy in the global world, in the global scene. Right? So, he could visit these places he knew in order to have a major consumer driven economy, he would need the know how of companies like Coca Cola. He knew in order to have an actually developed and truly world beating economy, he would need high tech innovation with technology that they didn't have. So, what better place than, say, Boeing that builds airplanes at the highest level of technical, technical manufacturing? Uh, and then, of course, if you want to be a global superpower, you've got to have a space program, right? And so that just gives you a very clear sense of how clearly, clear-minded this approach was. Now, of course, the world really changed on September 17, 2001. We don't typically remember this moment because we had other things on our mind, and this was buried on, on some page far back in the New York Times, but that was the moment of China's accession to the WTO. Now, the big deal had been done two years earlier when Jiang Zemin came in November of 1999, but the real moment the world shifted in terms of how the entire economic system was organized was when China's accession to the WTO was complete. And for China watchers and people who were advising companies during that time, you just saw the beginning of a tectonic shift 
that was really, really going to change the world, and it has uh, since that time period. Now, of course, by 2008, we see the greatest coming out party we've ever seen, right? And it's very funny. I was with some executives in, in London a couple of years ago, and we happened to have this program that had included the, the London bid for the Olympics, and it was just so interesting listening to those guys talk about how terrifying it was to be following Beijing in this train of events, because how, how could you compete with what they had done, right? And so this is the, you know, this has been the decade. Yet, even with that success, there's still somewhat of a doom and gloom story. As I mentioned, there still are all of these people who sit over on this end of the distribution. Every year we seem to have a new person. Uh, James Chanos was the person of flavor last year in 2010 because he was the guy who famously shorted Enron and was, made a lot of money doing it, and so people have listened to him about these kinds of things, and he's been famously saying, this is the House of Cards. We're still doing the House of Cards story, right? Now, his case is kind of interesting because he's basically been looking at real estate occupancy, and I think that his big problem is he spends a lot of time in Beijing and Shanghai, and he has no understanding for tier two cities, which is really where the action is in China today. So he's wrong, in my opinion. Um, but it's just interesting that we continually see this beat of the drum of whether it's from the house of cards notion of how the economy is structured or it's pollution uh, or it's the extent to which that pollution is actually going to affect the global economy or it's trade. Now the trade imbalance is an interesting one and in, in our conversation if we come back I'd like to talk more about this. I won't talk about it right now but this is a real red herring in the discussions about China as well. But then of course there's also politics. Probably the most, the most stringently uh, imbued vision that we have of China, the one that we cannot forget and it's burned into our minds, is 1989. And so what I'd like to do is frame that a little bit and talk about what the true empirical situation in China is, but also what the success of the economy is. But before I do that, I'd like to talk a little bit about the renewable energy piece, because this is actually, I think, the best case example, or it's the most salient one for right now in thinking about technology transfer. Because make no mistake about it, we have the best technology in the world on this front. We do. Right? A lot of the technology that China is capitalizing on is our technology. We hear a lot of stories about how China is stealing our technology. My view of this is a little bit different. My view is that the irony of our time is that the largest communist polity in the world is the most dynamic capitalist economy in the world, and we don't know how to do capitalism anymore. Yeah. We have fallen into a pit of debate and angry mudslinging about whether it's markets versus states, and the reality is that, of course, you need coordination of industrial development. This is how the automobile industry was developed in this country. This is how the steel industry was developed in this country. This is how the railroad industry was developed in this country. And somehow we have fallen into this abyss of a conversation that has gotten us so <coughs> off track in terms of thinking about the economy that the story is not just about technology transfer per se. It's about friendly business environments and states that actually think about innovation. And this is where we have to actually step up and learn. Okay? So I just want to give a couple examples of this that are key issues, then I'll back up and talk a little bit more about what China's uh, success stories have been about. So everybody talks about this issue about how China's speeding ahead in renewable energy, and you sort of have China up here, Europe here, and the U.S. down here. Um, and I'd love to hear your, your views on that when we get into the conversation, but that's sort of what the popular view among venture capitalists and people in the industrial world that I talk to are about. And we think, why is that happening? How can it be happening? Well, one of the things that's happening is that we spend a lot of time doing things like filing suits against China for unfair practices within the industry. Right? So last September, a suit was filed by the United States Steel Workers, which basically made the case that China's state-led investment in renewable energy is fundamentally unfair by WTO standards. Right? We also do a lot of symbolic things. People may remember when Jimmy Carter built solar panels on top of the White House, and then George Bush took them down, then Barack Obama put them back. Great, that's symbolism, and Barack Obama steps up and says, we do big things in this country, let's do big things. And you know what, we'll put aside a set of money in tax credits, and that will be how we save this, this sector. 
Meanwhile, China, just last year alone, was investing $35 billion in the development of this industry. That's not tax credits. That's pure capital. And on top of that pure capital, of course, you have a lot of federally guaranteed loans and guaranteed procurement prices. Right? Now, you can, we can argue about whether that's unfair, but most venture capitalists will tell you that the reason we're on the sidelines is because exit strategies for venture capital, we typically look for seven to eight year windows. Right? Developing this sector is going to take 15 years. Right? So we don't, it's not in our economic interest to put the money on the table until we can actually see some co-investment from the government and it has to be more than tax credits. Now let me tell you three quick stories, two of which relate to this directly, one of which is a little bit orthogonal, but I think it's relevant for these conversations. A couple months ago, I was sitting with uh, Chad Holliday, who's the former D, uh, chairman and CEO of DuPont, talking about these issues, and he said, I'm going to tell you a story that exactly resonates with what you know telling me now. 2007, DuPont was looking to build a new photovoltaic array plant, right, thin film. Chad actually said, when I was talking to him, he said, you know, I would have, I, I would have put a, a plant in the U.S., but, you know, the ways in which you have the relationships with governments to do these things, it's just not very aggressive, and frankly, we were, wouldn't have even known who to call at that moment. But the Chinese and the Singaporeans heard, we didn't even call them, but they heard we were in the market. Right? So they called us up and they said, we want you, come here. So they got into kind of a bidding war. Right? And the Singaporeans are offering this, the Guangzhou government is offering this, back and forth, back and forth. They end up going with Guangdong province, right? spearheaded by Guangzhou. They wanted some protection for their intellectual property, so they said, worked out a deal where they could put their research facility in Hong Kong. It was all great. And then the economic crisis of 2008 hit. So Chad calls up the government and he says, you know what, I think we have to scale back that research facility. It's just like, i got to be economically responsible here. And they said, what's the problem? He said, well, look at the economy. How can I, what do you mean, what's the problem? And they said, well, what would you need to make your worries go away? And he kind of offhandedly said, how about two years guaranteed procurement? Pretty low prices. He didn't expect them to say yes, but they did. They said, sure, you got it, done. So they built the facility, and they are there, and they are operational. Right? I'll tell you another story. This one's been in the news a lot more recently. Evergreen Solar, right? You're nodding your head. You know this story, right? This story has been all about how evil it is that after these deals were done and the Massachusetts government put money on the table and built facilities and built roads and tax rates, etc., the Chinese stole this company. Maybe there's a little bit of truth to that. But there's a different story that often doesn't get reported, which was that about a sixth or seventh of the bond issuance of this country was underwritten by Lehman. So when Lehman collapsed, they lost all of a, a chunk of the money that actually made them financially viable in a market that's very uncertain. So they went to the government and said, we need some of that TARP money. The government said, you're not a financial institution, you can't have TARP money. And they said, but you've got to help us. You know, Lehman no longer is a viable underwriter. The TARP money's sitting in the banks. They're not giving us any of the loans. Maybe you can guarantee a loan for us. We'll get a federally guaranteed loans, and then Citigroup or someone will step up. No, no, can't do it, can't do it. So it became economically impossible for this com company to, to, to stay viable. Except the Chinese are over here saying, we'll do everything you need. Right? So their, uh, their question was not, how do we make more money by going to China? Their question was, how do we stay alive? And the Chinese are the only ones that are creating the conditions with which we can do that. Right? And so that's a sobering story. And maybe some people disagree with that story. But I think we need to look deeply with what we're actually doing to build economies around these issues of innovation. There's one final piece that doesn't necessarily re relate directly to innovation and technology transfer. But I hear this issue over and over again, so I have to mention it. I talk to a lot of mid-cap companies, manufacturing companies in the Midwest, who will say things like, you know, it's not going to necessarily save us any money to move to China, especially because of the needs of how we're going to have to protect our IPR. So why are you going? To be honest, we just can't get the skilled labor here. We are standing right now 
at the end of a 30-year period of the absolute evisceration of vocational education in this country. We have destroyed that sector. Now, most people who will defend it will say, no, we haven't looked at the statistics. And the statistics do look like they're up, but they have all been replaced by what's called vocational technical education. Almost every vocational school in cities like Cleveland have replaced their skilled labor vocational schools with computer training. Right? Very nice, and it's all part of the high-tech revolution, but does it create the skilled labor? Mid-cap manufacturers in the United States will tell you there is such a deeper skilled labor pool in places like China and Germany. Germany is actually the other interesting case in this. We talk a lot about the unfair relationships between trade with respect to the United States and China. We talk very little. We have a trade imbalance with Germany, too. So that Germany is a much better manufacturing infrastructure than we are, and part of it is because of vocational education. Now let me shift gears and talk a little bit about China, because I do think that there's an interesting story here that has to do with innovation. Now China often gets hit because, or, or kind of criticized, uh, as just being a large economy and not, it's never going to be a great economy like ours because innovation doesn't happen there. Are they developing an indigenous high-tech economy? And it is absolutely true that they rely very heavily on technology transfer as the engine for such rapid growth. Now we can talk about whether or not that's fair. Right? In the Chinese mindset, there's basically a quid pro quo. You want access to our internal markets? You sign the agreements that will transfer the technology within X number of years. Right? So Motorola felt, for example, like it was very unfair when many knockoff phone companies came in 1996 and 97 and basically pushed them out of the Chinese market. In the Chinese viewpoint, Motorola was allowed to operate from 1988 to 96 with a wholly owned foreign enterprise that protected their, pro their intellectual property with an agreement in place, they made a lot of money. If you look at Mo Motorola stocks and sales during that time, they made a huge amount of money in China from 88 to 96, and then it was time to pay the piper, and that's what happened. So that's kind of the Chinese view, and we can have a debate about whether or not that's the right thing to do, but they always are very upfront about how to do that. But let's take a step back for a second then, and just talk about the key features of this economy. I like to focus on six key features in my work. Uh, I'm going to talk primarily about four of them because I think they're the most important. They are gradualism, decentralization, openness to foreign direct investment, and the government coordination of the economy. Right? There's also important things about the private economy and, and what I call the quiet revolution of institutions, and I'm happy to talk about those as well, but let me just talk about these four first, uh, and then we'll push on from there. Gradualism. Gradualism is not just an interesting thing that has kind of been a quaint approach to the economy in China. In my view, gradualism actually radically turns on its head what the right way to build an economy is. And it is in diametric opposition to what we do in the United States. In the United States, our basic, the basic relationship between the field of economics and policy making around economic development tends to be you build a theoretical mathematical model that's based on a couple of key assumptions. One of those key assumptions, for example, is the sacrosanct value of private property as the cornerstone of capitalism. You also have a couple of other key ideas about individual incentives, methodological individualism in terms of assumptions about rational economic action, etc. You build that model, then that model is very, very elegant mathematically, but very simplistic in terms of actually understanding the way the world works economically. right? And you try to force that model into a top-down understanding of what the economic policy should be. In China, the process is exactly opposite. So the Chinese, coming going back to Deng Xiaoping, like to talk about the economic development as a process of what they what they say in Chinese is more shi guohe, which means groping for stones to cross the river. Right? You know where you're going, but this turbulent white water rapids is a little bit difficult to navigate. So you've got to experiment on a gradual basis where you figure out where the stones are and you figure out what the path across the river is. Right? Now, that's a nice kind of metaphor or symbolism, but it actually really does work that way. So a lot of people, I remember in 1994 when I was living in Shanghai, a lot of people talked and criticized China because there was no labor law. Where's the labor law? Especially a lot of the human rights organizations. Where's the labor law? These are just a bunch of authoritarian autocrats. We know that because of what happened in 1989. And these guys are holding on to power because they don't want to respect individual civil liberty by doing something like developing the labor law. The Chinese kept saying, we're doing it. We're doing it. Just give us some time. 
What, what's so hard about it? Why do you need time? There are many models of what labor laws are like in the, around the world. Pick one and adopt it. But what China was reluctant to say, and what it had been doing, is since 1983, it had been experimenting in 31 different provincial level areas with labor contracts, different approaches to labor contracts, different approaches to actually implementing them, three, five, seven year labor contracts, the ways in which actually people will actually deal with implementation at the local level. All of that was part of a feedback loop. So by the time they passed the labor law in 1994, they knew very well how it was going to be implemented, and people in the provinces knew very well what it was going to be like. In every single area that China has been developing in, on the industrial development and on the more general economic development side, that has been the process of change. And so it's a, gradualism, I think, is one of the most important things in thinking about innovation. Uh, it is a very different mindset in terms of innovation, and it's very different from what we do. This is not to say that we don't have great ideas in this country. But it is to say that those ideas tend to come from pockets of the private sector, and are, they're not usually necessarily supported by industrial development policy. Okay? So that's, that's one of the key things. Second thing to know about China, which is probably the most important but most understated issue, there is no China. China is a collection of 31 provincial level units, and they are all in competition with each other. So when people talk, for example, about intellectual property right violations, they say, why doesn't Beijing do anything about this? They have copyright laws on the books. Beijing has no control. You have to understand that about China. The entire logic of the economic reforms has been to set up a competition between local governments. And it's not just at the provincial level. You see this municipal level competition going on as well. And it is what creates China as a dynamic economy. The interesting thing is that the economists got it wrong. Private property is not the cornerstone of a viable or healthy market economy. Competition is. We should know this in our own economy as well, because of course, it didn't matter that GM was a publicly traded property, you know, it was out of the private sector. It was a wildly inefficient company because it was part of an oligopoly. The problem is not private property. The problem is competition. So China created that competition. A lot of economists wondered about this in the 80s and 90s because they were saying, how could it be that China hasn't privatized the way we told all of these countries to? And Jeff Sachs doesn't like to admit it now, but he was responsible for the crashing of the Russian economy because he advocated rapid privatization. Right? Rapid privatization basically destroys a lot of viable assets, and it's not even getting at the heart of what's important, which is competition, right? If you wipe out an economy that way and have no legal infrastructure to control it, you will get the mafia coming in and control it, and you will have oligopoly control just the same, right? But if you create local competition, you're much better off. So what China did, rather than privatizing, was localize. That is the key feature of the economic reforms, is that innovation in China came through localization. Because local politicians actually had the economic interests aligned with success of their political units. So that's a key feature of China. Now let me talk a little bit more about this because this is really, really important. I mentioned how James Chanos is so wrong about China. He is wrong because he doesn't understand where the action in China is. The action in China is not in Shanghai, Beijing, Tianjin. All those cities are doing well, Chongqing. The action is in these second tier cities, like Chengdu. Chongqing thought it was going to be far out ahead of Chengdu because it was going to be the gateway to the West. It was the municipal level, the provincial level city of the West. But you know what? Chongqing is a pretty corrupt place. Chengdu, on the other hand, has an entrepreneurial government that is incredibly aggressive to the foreign direct investment community, and they're not corrupt. All right? And so the key to China is actually understanding how all of these localities work together. Now, there is an important thing just to note graphically, because when you think about powerhouse cities that can actually become economic powerhouses themselves, when we're talking about the quote unquote second tier in China, cities over a million people, we're talking about a very different competitive economic landscape than in the United States. So it's just a very different dynamic. If you map onto this fact, all of these places which have local governments which are endowed with enough power to do innovative institutional development ideas, you have a very different situation. Most of the wealth creation is happening in the second tier cities as well. 
It's important to note, for example, places like Chengdu, a thousand new cars a day on the road in Chengdu, right? And there's no near end in sight for that kind of economic development. Um, let me tell you one more quick story about the decentralization piece because I mentioned earlier Suzhou. In my opinion, the most innovative city in all of China. Amazing. Now, one of the things that's interesting about the story of Suzhou, I remember in the mid-1990s, and I remember this one time very specifically, I went to the Hongqiao Airport in Shanghai. I wanted to buy a plane ticket to Nanjing. I said, we don't fly to Nanjing. No planes today, how about tomorrow? No, no, you don't understand, we don't fly to Nanjing. What do you mean you don't fly to Nanjing? Well, we don't like Nanjing. How, what are we talking about? So the, but the concept that was going on here was that Shanghai was actually very concerned because property values were rising so quickly in China, uh, in Shanghai. And Nanjing is the next major city up the river of the Yangtze. So what's going to happen is that a lot of companies are going to just start moving their operations up to Nanjing because it's much cheaper, right? And they still have access to the port. So China, Shanghai started making it very difficult to fly to Nanjing or to even travel to Nanjing. But what the Jiangsu government did was then they took endowed this young mayor Zhang with enough power, built a relationship between him and the Singaporean government. They got a nine billion dollar investment from the Singaporean government to build the Singapore Suzhou Industrial Development Park. That park, again, if you spend time in Pudong, you're probably amazed. Go to Suzhou. Think about a place that is a landfill that didn't exist 15 years ago and see what's there. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Now, the interesting thing in terms of innovation is that they have so much foreign direct investment. For a while, it was the number one destination of FDI in China. And that park now is a public-private partnership that is planning to go public on the Singaporean Stock Exchange. Right, so you have just a very interesting, boundless sense of what's possible in these dynamics. <clears throat> now, there are problems with this system. China's population is heavily stacked towards the eastern seaboard. They don't have near the land capacity that we have. Uh, and those will be, it will be interesting to see how, they, how that actually feeds into the tier two city development process. A couple more key issues and then I'll close. Um, I also think I mentioned this critique of renewable energy and the differences in terms of guiding the economy. I personally think that it is essential to have governmental bodies that think across industries and think in a coordinating fashion about industrial development. I think you cannot have a successful economy any other way. I think every economy in the world that is a dominant economy in the world except for ours operates like that. And in our case, we did up until about the 1970s. And so I actually think it's crucial. Now, in China, for example, you have the State on Asset Supervision and Administration Commission, which in my view, in the industrial world and in terms of industrial development, is the most important body in all of China. Um, it's always interesting to me when I talk to people in the equities business or the securities firms, you know, they, they're basically you know, making money off investing people's assets in China, and you'll bring up SASIC, and they'll say, what is SASIC? And I'm just like, what, what are you talking about? Like, how can you be investing people's money? If you are investing in blue chip companies, this is the company to be talking about. But there's just also this general cross-industry coordinating issue that I think is incredibly important. China's very open to foreign direct investment, and this is where the technology transfer piece becomes so critical. Every company that is there, again, there is a basic assumption, a quid pro quo, that if you're here, you will be transferring the technology to us eventually. Now, different companies have different views of this, right? If you're Intel, your view of it is like, yeah, technology transfer happens, theft happens. We don't really care because our view is that's going to happen if you're in China. Our goal is just to be two, two uh, curves ahead, right? Now, Intel is in the luxurious position that it costs $2 billion to build a fab site, and so by the time China builds a fab site that's copying their technology, they're already so far to the next generation that it doesn't really matter. Most companies don't have that luxury, right? And when Motorola signed the joint venture agreement with the Hangzhou Telecommunication Factory, it took basically one year for the technology to be out the door, right? But again, you just have to decide, I think, as a company, whether or not that's going to be okay. 
Right? You have to decide whether or not you basically are going to make as much money in China as you can until the technology goes out the door and the competition drives the prices down and then you can't compete anymore. Right? Or you can take the, the Intel approach and say, we're just going to be ahead of the curve. There is another important piece of this, and I'll talk about this in a minute, though, is that the companies that are actually really thinking about China as driving their economic success across the world. So GM has actually been in this boat. Their most successful part of the organization globally has been their China operations, which is a joint venture with the, 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 the Shanghai Automotive Industrial Corporation. Pepsi. I think is another interesting company that basically thinks about how important process innovation is uh, and that China is actually driving their own innovation that's feeding back into the company. Um, another good example might be, um, well, even Cisco. I think Cisco is an interesting case. They've had so much tension with Huawei over the theft of technology, but note that they, settled, they and Motorola have settled their cases because they realize that they can't afford to not be in China. Right? And so there are all kinds of examples here of where that technology uh, theft, if we want to call it, or just the transfer of the technology butts up against what the market opportunity is. And so that's really where I think the interesting piece of the puzzle lies for, company, for companies that are investing in China. There has been very rapid growth of a private economy in China, and that's an important piece of this puzzle as well. We see directed state control from above, but also growing competition from below, which I think is a, is a great and fascinating part of the story. And there has been, uh, China gets not enough credit, in my view, from, for the institutional transformation that is happening in China. I have some pretty strong views on when and how democrat democratization is happening that I will, well, we can talk about in a few minutes if you want. Uh, I won't dwell on it right now. Uh, the one final piece that I do want to come back to, though, is that there is an interesting thing about innovation, where we typically think about innovation as the development of indigenous high-tech products. Right? We think of product innovation first and foremost. But one place that China is most interesting, and there's a very good book that came out on this recently uh, by a guy named Danny Bresnitz, uh, uh, who really talks eloquently about process innovation. And you will hear this particular issue over and over again from companies that are working in China, where you might not see the indigenous high-tech economy coming, but you do see a tremendous amount of process innovation, which is what makes it so perfect or so valuable for companies like Pepsi and IBM to be there. Um, as I mentioned, I think it's particularly interesting and ironic because I think we've kind of lost our way with respect to this. I think we've had a very, in the past, have had a very healthy relationship between state industrial policy and the private sector, and I think we've, we've lost that in this country, and I think it's a real problem. Uh, and the final thing is, uh, uh, this is just sort of more tongue-in-cheek, but I, I was found it particularly painful watching the, uh, the World Cup. Uh, you know, one of China's famous green energy companies is Ingli Solar, uh, and there was this particular moment in the World Cup when I was like, China is advertising Ingli Solar, and we're exporting McDonald's. Uh, and it just, you know, I don't think that's really true, but it just struck me as a key moment. There is also good stories here, right? There is a great story about the, the building of a, a, a photovoltaic array uh, facility in the south side of Chicago uh, that happened relatively recently. And in some ways, it kind of mirrors the, the innovation and the, the kind of entrepreneurial approach from a local government that we see that I've been talking about with respect to China. So it's not, not all is lost. I think that this kind of thing can happen. Uh, I also have been spending a lot of time recently talking with the DC government, and in particular, Victor Hoskins, the Deputy Mayor of Economic Development, about whether or not those kind of opportunities are, are out there for, for the DC economy. And I think there are interesting, there's an interesting appetite for that sort of thing. Um, and so I guess just in closing, I'll say we need to kind of, I think, back away from this, the, the pure allegiance to the market because I don't actually think you get major innovation. You might get innovation, but you don't get a scalable innovation on the industrial sector that way. Um, but you also get cross, we also need cross-industry strategizing uh, as a way of actually thinking about how the economy is going to be directed through the process of, of, of uh, global development.